Good evening, everybody. Thanks very much for joining our webinar this evening. Um, we've got lots of people listening live, so hopefully we'll have lots of questions and good discussion. Um, for those who are listening on YouTube afterwards, please do remember to hit subscribe for more from AHDB Dairy's uh, digital channels. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm really pleased to introduce Dullan Harris and John Roach, who are joining us this evening. Um, Dullan is from Tethenaregloys Farm, which is one of the AHDB Dairy strategic farms. Um, so Dullan Farms in, is in West Wales with his wife Hannah and obviously their wider team. The farm's in a joint venture arrangement um, and Dullan and Hannah take a very strict business approach to, to running uh, the farm to make it a profitable business. Um, both are from a non-dairy background um, and they've worked very hard to get where they are today, but perhaps more importantly, they've worked smartly. Um, so Dalan believes that at specific times of year, it's worth pushing production to generate extra income. Um, and he wants to ensure that um, pushing production isn't compromising overall profit, nor environmental impact. So that was really the start point for this conversation, um, which is why we've invited John Roach to join us all the way from New Zealand. So morning, John. Um, so thanks for being with us. John's dairy career has taken him from Ireland all the way to New Zealand and several countries in between, as I believe. Um, John is currently the Chief Science Advisor for the Ministry of Primary Industries in New Zealand, but he also runs his own consultancy business, Down to Earth Advice. So warm welcome to you both. Um, thanks for being here. We'll, we'll come over to you, uh, Dalan, just after I explain to people how they can ask questions. Um, so, a little bit of housekeeping. Anyone listening in is muted and any questions that you submit are completely anonymous. So, you know, please do feel free to ask anything at all. To ask a question, you can see the little orange arrow in the top right hand corner of your screen. If you click onto that arrow, it opens a box and there's a little box called questions. And Type your questions into there and we'll do our absolute best to answer as many as possible. Um, okay, so, um, yep, yeah, this is one of our strategic farm events. Um, you can see that Dullan's farm is sort of out in the furthest West Wales, but we've got a huge network of farms. Um, and it's it's been a little while since we've been out on farm, I suppose, just because of COVID. But the good the good side of that is that we've been able to really adapt and do digital and uh, reach out to expertise all over the world. And tonight's a really good example of that. So thanks for being with us. So Dolan, could you please introduce yourself and the farm? Um, perhaps cover a little bit about how you've managed your production over the years and how your career has progressed as a result of your production profile. Yeah, um, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Dolan Harris. <clears throat> um, yeah, I farm here with my wife, Hannah, um, in a joint venture agreement with uh, Kim and Bryony Petty. Um, we currently milk, um, or we calve about 630 spring calving cows and we average about 550 uh, throughout the year um, milking cows. Um, we started off, I suppose, with quite a low, low um, stocking rate on the grazing platform, um, milking about 300 cows on about 120 hectares. Um, we did a lot more milk from grazed grass then. Um, and I suppose as the stock rate's gone up, we've needed to feed on the shoulders a bit more and found actually feeding on the shoulders can be quite a profitable way um, with our milk contract as we're on a, um, a plus seasonality through the um, autumn and winter months. So I suppose that's made us rethink um, kind of the the original New Zealand sort of system, I suppose, and try and optimise our contract um, to make as much money as we can by looking after the cows and looking after the environment. Um, and that's brought us on this path, I suppose, of kind of efficiency, um, not kind of producing the marginal litre, which we potentially couldn't make no money on, but try and optimise that production 
on those shoulder mounts, um, which has brought us to where we are now, really. So that's quite interesting, Dallan, actually, because one of the things that's come up um, through AHDB recently, some of the work that um, our market intelligence team has been doing, um, has shown that 40% um, of the milk, which is destined for the liquid market, um, is actually delivered with a butterfat level lower than the base of 4%, and 55% of the milk delivered for manufacturing is falling below the base price sort of payment there. So AHDB have actually identified that if all of those litres had have hit the, the butterfat, specs for their contracts it would have generated in the region of 38 million pounds extra income at the farm level so maximizing the contract that you're on is just absolutely vital to overall farm profitability i suppose but but not chasing at any cost and i think that's been what you've tried to do really yes yes try yeah we try and um try and do it as as kind of well planned as we can you know we know when we're going to have to feed extra kind of give or take a couple of weeks in the autumn um you know we can watch the markets through the summer and try and buy buy feed at the right time for quite good value for money rather than being caught on the spot which um could be quite a costly um feed but also it's quite interesting on on our system we, if you look at litres, we um, produce a lot more milk in um, April, May and June. But if you can look at our milk solids production per month, our production curve is actually quite flat. Um, oh, yes, we do produce more milk solids in the, in the spring, but um, it's a lot flatter than what it would be in litre form then. I just wonder, is it worth you talking through what your... Um feeding the cows at the moment and how how this season's gone uh yeah so we had quite a difficult spring very slow spring same as lots of people across the country um so we fed more than what we'd have liked to this spring um kind of through april and may but once we got going we had you know loads of grass so we we generally feed about five kilos of cake in the parlor through the spring period um it's uh, cake in the parlor is a little bit more costly than buying in straight but it seems to work quite well when the cows are out day and night um just logistically it works and then once we have enough grass we cut that back um Hold on a second, Dylan. Can I just check? I've lost sound for you. Have you accidentally hit the mute button by any chance? I, I've lost sound as well, Jamie. OK, Dylan, we've we've lost you, hopefully temporarily. Um, what we might do, do you want to just speak up again, please? Yeah, I, I, I can hear you now. Got it. Got it. Sorry, we just lost you. You were talking through um, feeding cake in the parlour and sort of how that was different versus straight. Yeah, so we feed about five kilos in the parlour through kind of the spring period until our grass um, kind of meets demand. Then we cut them back to about between, it was generally two to three kilos through the summer pretty much then. Um, and then once we get into the autumn and we start feeding silage, um, we'd replace that with, so this year we've got brewer's grains going into them. They're having half a kilo in the parlour and they're having four kilos of brewer's grains. Um, and it, yeah, they're milking really well off it. So we're really pleased with how they're milking this autumn. Just to give people an idea, how much grass are you grazing, you know, graze grass throughout the season? Um, so, to date this year, we've grown uh, 15.1 tonne, 
so we'll probably grow another half a ton to a ton um up until christmas it's just we it's our best year we've had here just by two um best we've done before now is 14.9 um it's been a good grass growing year and suited our farm it's a very dry farm we need rain in the summer if we can get rain in the summer we grow lots of grass and what fur rates would you have used um so to date we've used about 180 kilos of n per hectare So just on that topic, to put you on the spot, um, Wales has got some new water regulations. Do you feel ready for those? Yeah, we'll, yeah, it'll be fine. Yeah. yeah, no, I think I think we've done we've done as much as we can to put ourselves in a good position. You know, we've 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 done lots of work on the farm over the last seven or eight years with liming and reseeding and getting our P's and K's at a good level. Um, so yeah, I'm confident that we'll we'll be fine. Okay, and then I've just got one final question before we move on to John. Is um, obviously fertilizer prices are the hot topic of conversation at the moment. Um, will you change anything next year? Do you imagine as a result? No, I don't think so. It works. It works. Yeah, fertilizer is going to be expensive, but it grazed grass will still be our cheapest feed by far so um yeah no i don't think there's nothing that i can think of uh, for drastic changes then yeah fab right thank you very much that's sort of given us a little bit of a picture of of the farm and we'll bring you back into the conversation as as we go through the discussion but i'll invite John to put your camera back on and um, hopefully we can see your presentation shortly. Yeah, I think I need to, do I need permission to share or? Yeah, oh, here we go. that should be coming across now. And hopefully this is the right one. Is that, that's in screen share, is it Jamie? Perfect, yeah. Perfect, excellent. Well, thanks, Jamie, and thanks, Dylan, um, like, and, and thanks to AHDB for giving me the opportunity to be here this evening, your time this morning over here. Another beautiful morning in the Waikato, nice soft rain falling overnight. Dylan, you'd have loved it in the middle of July. Um, so, look, uh, I, 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 this, is, this is a subject I've become um, quite passionate about, as, as in probably a number of you will have heard me speak on in, in previous years, but um, I do want to start off with... Um, I do want to start off with a disclaimer uh, that I am not a financial advisor, and and so this isn't meant to be financial advice. The vast majority of what I'm going to present to you, I've learned through observation of farmers in, in different parts of the world, um, and and also a lot of the farm systems research that I've been privileged to to be a part of, um, to to explain it all. So just as a bit of background, like I grew up in the southwest of Ireland, my brother still farms there, milking uh, 150 cows. Um, embarrassing to say that uh, what, 30, 32 years ago, 30, yeah, nearly, yeah, just over 32 years ago, I left uh, to go to university with the full intent of uh, becoming a nutritionist and um, at that stage heading to Saudi Arabia. Where, where a young fella could make a lot of money in a very short period of time feeding cows. Love driving tractors, love feeding cows, love milking cows, love standing beside the jars of uh, that were that were absolutely full and, and just seeing what a cow could could produce. And during my time in in uni, it was a, it was a real crossroads in Ireland. Um, we had uh, Alistair Rain and Sharon Holmes at the time. Sharon Rain now come out as consultants and they, it, it, they initiated a large debate on grazing management and how we manage cows on pasture. And uh, myself and my brother were involved in Sharon's discussion group and so I learned volumes from her and, and went on to do a master's in grazing management in, um, in Moore Park then. Um, left, left Moore Park, went to Australia and and on to New Zealand from there, and I'm not going to go. I won't go through the detailed history, but 
started developing uh, dairy farms in Canterbury uh, back in the early parts of the 2000s. And um, having been reasonably successful at that and thought we knew everything about it, we went to the United States to uh, develop dairy farms in Missouri. This is a picture of a grazing dairy farm that we established in Missouri. And it was here that I probably learned everything I needed to learn about economics. Uh, certainly none of the microeconomics I learned in, in university uh, paled in comparison to this. Um, my father always told me that the School of Life has very hefty tuition fees. And when I went into the United States, I was uh, 34 years of age, uh, was financially very secure, full, full f financial plan to be fully retired by the age of 45. And then the world financial crisis hit, and um, and this this turned into an unmitigated disaster. Um, so I'll be working for a few years yet, and as many of you will know, I'm a little bit over 45 now. Um, look, I went to uh, I left New Zealand in 2006 and went back to Australia. Um, went to take up a position at the University of Tasmania for 18 months, and I came back in 2007 and had seen some massive changes you know it was it was staggering to see when i left in 06 or 07 a farm dairy uh, milking parlor with a grain silo outside stood out as being unusual there was very few farms within shed feeding by the time i got back in 07 08 it was the farms that didn't have a grain silo standing outside the milking parlor that were unusual virtually every farm or a large number of farms over that space of 18 months had had put in grain feeders the other thing that was highly that became very obvious, particularly at the end of that year, as we did the financial analysis of, of the industry, was that cost of production had jumped about a dollar. And the, the expense that, that stood out massively was feed. Feed had jumped 80 cents, it had uh, sorry, 60 cents. It had gone from about 80, 80 cents per kilogram of milk solids to a dollar forty per kilogram of milk solids. Most of the other costs hadn't changed greatly. Maintenance and running costs had increased slightly. And those of you who remember 07, 08 and the massive fuel price hike will understand that. And fertilizer prices, urea prices went up quite significantly as we're seeing now as well. Attitude changed. Um, we went from talking a lot about grass at discussion groups, talking a lot about body condition score and how to manage the system through feed deficits to talking a lot about feeding cows. It became a very cow-centric discussion. Um, and more and more, I was hearing conversations around nutrition. Most of them very, most of them were actually misinformation. Actually, some of them would have been disinformation, I, I feel. But, you know, as a trained nutritionist, I couldn't understand the logic uh, behind a lot of these conversations. And, uh, we, we saw a, a, a real shift in, in 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 culture and conversation. So, for example, I just want to use an example of a of a discussion group I turned up to. Um, this was, I think, it was in about 2009, 2010, maybe. Oh, no, actually, maybe, maybe 2000. Uh, I can't remember. It was um, it was in those years in a way. And um, and I'd been sitting on my ass in, in the office for way too long. And this discussion group was on up the road, and I knew it was a good farmer. Heard lots about him. Had never been on the farm, and so decided I'd, I'd I'd pop up on up the road and see see what's happening. And actually, there you go. It was in 2014. I was uh, I was wrong. Um, and this farmer was producing around 1,100 kilos of milk solids year in year out on average enough peat country to to the uh, north of Hamilton City. And um, but it was a very very consistent system. The average farmer for that district was also producing about a hundred, uh, sorry, a thousand to 1100 kilos of milk solids per hectare. So um, on a production basis, this farmer was, was doing the average and the top 20% of farmers um, on an economic basis were producing 30 to 35% more milk. So we were inside in the shed. It was a terrible winter's day, pouring rain, wind howling outside, we're sitting huddled in a shed and the topic of conversation was the top 20% of farmers are producing 34% more milk than you. Why don't you feed more supplements? You're leaving milk on the table. That was the catchphrase that I took away from the day. You're leaving milk on the table. Now, the reason why I'm, I'm highlighting this is this was a full farm assessment. This farmer had provided all of his information, physical and financial. 
And the financial information was was quite interesting. He and his family were were um, had a, had a, an operating profit, so the equivalent of EBIT, of uh, between four thousand and four and a half thousand dollars per hectare per year. Now he's milking on approximately one hundred and fifty hectares, four and a half uh, sorry four hundred and fifty cows. Um, so this this was an incredibly profitable business. The average farmer was uh, making between, um, let's say, $2,500 and $3,000. So a third, 30 to 40% less profit than him. And in fact, what the data showed was that he was sitting in the top 20% of operating profit. Um, he was one of that top 20% farmers. He just wasn't producing that volume of milk. But the conversation was was continually about producing more milk. Um, as you can see, uh, Gord here is, is is the farm I'm talking about in Gordonton. Um, his feed costs were, and grazing costs were substantially less than the either the average or the top 20%. So he was running a, a highly profitable, very lean business that was not as exposed to external forces as as other businesses were. And I would imagine was in a very good position when um, milk price collapsed the following year. But hey, look, th that, that was the conversation that was happening. And that was, you know, and I'm sure you guys see this at some of your discussion groups as well. Although, to be honest, the, the ones I've been at in the UK, I, 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 it, it tends to remind me more of the conversations we used to have in, in New Zealand in the early parts of the 2000s. But look, the supplements were going in. Uh, more milk was being produced per cow. More milk was being produced per hectare. More cows were being milked per FTE. So all of the metrics were, were reasonably po positive. And when you look at the uh, financial analysis of the systems, it didn't seem to matter if someone was a low input system, the bubble on the left hand side of this graph, a medium input, um, which is approximately a ton of supplement a cow, uh, predominantly maize silage or palm kernel um, in the South Island, maybe some crops for winter, or a high input system, um, great, greater than one and a half ton of supplement a cow, uh, return on assets was, was virtually the same. So farmers were profitable. The interesting thing to me was more feed to produce more milk did not increase profitability. And this perplexed me a little bit. I'll come back to that in a second. I'll come back to it now, I suppose. Why, why, I, was, um, why I was confused. So in all of my theoretical learnings, past utilization was the most important physical factor for profit. Cost control was the most important financial factor for profit. Um, and, 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 and many of you will have seen these types of graphs before. I present them, others uh, around the world present them as well, showing that as operating expenses go up, operating profit declines, uh, and as pasture utilization goes up, operating profit increases. So, so we, we had the belief or we, we, we um, the advice that we were providing to farmers through the, the noughties and the early part of the 2010s was that it didn't matter what system of farming you farmed, as long as you were utilizing all your grass and you could keep your, your costs under control. Right. And then I went on sabbatical to Ireland. And this look, with, sorry, without without wanting to be blasphemous, this was my uh, this was my Saint Paul on the road to Damascus moment. This was this was my my coming to Jesus moment. Um, when I I arrived in early April of 2013, um, and uh, my my bum was not long sitting in the chair in the office that they had given to me, when there a, a crowd of uh, researchers filed in through the door to tell me that the New Zealand dairy industry was, was heading for bankruptcy and that I was complicit because of the advice that I and others of my colleagues had been providing for a decade by not telling farmers that supplements were evil and that uh, they should go back to the way they were farming. And look, like any good Irishman that's challenged, I uh, didn't take it light, lying down. And I said, look, that's, that's bull. I will, um, I'm gonna prove it to you. So I went back and I got the, the data for the, the 10 years beforehand, from 2002, 2003, to 2012, 2013, um, or sorry, 2011, 2012 actually, and, um, and plotted out the average farm 
the average the it was the average farm had gone from 285 cows to 395 cows in that period they had increased their revenue astronomically from about four hundred thousand dollars to nearly a million dollars consistently over the over that period um of course their costs had gone up they they had brought in supplements they had to bring in the infrastructure that went with that they had to bring in the labor to milk more cows etc but when you looked at their free cash at the end of the day their free cash had increased from an average of around fifty thousand dollars to around two hundred thousand dollars so new zealand farmers were making more money now than they were 10 years ago that was the message and that's what i went back with and um that was fine. They accepted that, but they said, but what would happen if they did nothing? Model that, which was a good exercise. So I went back and I kept the status quo. I said, all right, 285 cows, they're going to be producing 30 to 40% less milk. And so there's less revenue, accepting the increase in milk price, but they were still going from around 400,000 to closer to $600,000 in revenue. They hadn't brought in all of these different feeds, so I inflation adjusted the actual expenses that were there in 2002 to 2005, and we still saw an increase in, in costs, but it wasn't uh, as, as stark as the real situation. And in fact, the free cash at the end of the day was exactly the same. So the message I took from this, and this was a very coarse analysis, was that the average farmer was now producing 40% milk, more milk, milking 30% more cows, and yet making no more money. This did not seem like a sensible strategy to me. Um, at the same time on this sabbatical, George Ramsbottom was just embarking about on his PhD, and he had began to analyze the, the Irish uh, financial database and saw, look, I, I, I got a look at the preliminary results and I thought, wow, these were, these were amazing. They, they really, really surprised me. And so I wanted to get involved. And, um, the headline out of it, very unpopular headline, was that as the percent of the cow's diet that were non-pasture feeds increased, so as the amount of silage and concentrates that were coming into the farm increased, operating profit declined. Now, this was at a time, remember, when Irish farmers were gearing up for quotas to be removed. They were uh, increasing cow numbers. They were taking out blocks of land to grow silage, to bring them onto the platform, et cetera. There was a lot of movement towards intensification. Um, and, and, and yet the, the, the Irish data was suggesting that that wasn't a sensible strategy. And what this figure means is that for every 1% of the, of non, of the cow's diet, that was non-pasture feed. So that's approximately six kilos, six to seven kilos. For every 1%, operating profit declined seven euro 22 in Ireland. So basically for every extra, for every kilo of, of feed being brought into a farm in Ireland, operating, sorry, for every, yes, for every kilo of feed being brought into a farm in Ireland, operating profit was dropping one euro. It didn't make sense to me. I couldn't understand this. I was doing the same partial budgets as everybody else. And if a, if a kilo of feed was costing the average Irish farmer 20 cents and they were getting paid 30 cents for their milk, how the heck could that be true? It just couldn't understand it. However, that analysis did show one, a, another interesting thing. And that was the hidden costs of feeding um, and I'm going to come back to this later, but the headline here was that for every hundred euro an Irish farmer was spending on feed, his or her total costs were going up 153 euro. This was far greater than anyone had ever considered, and certainly most people didn't believe it. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Now, so I went back to New Zealand and um, told people of, of what I had done on my sabbatical and said, look, I think we need to we need to hold fire here, take stock. This was this was at the end of 2013, uh, beginning of 2014. I was looking at the world market for milk. I was seeing the same trends that other people were seeing, which was, you know, uh, a, a massive oversupply looming relative to market, and and we all remember what happened after that. But I, I my my reckoning was I couldn't understand what was wrong here. Farmers were still utilizing all their grass. We knew that. We were, we were taking the measurements. Uh, we were out in discussion groups. There was no evidence of grass being wasted. Cost control hadn't gone out of, out of control completely. So 
those two stables of the advice that we were given, if you were using all your pasture and you were keeping your costs low, you were still going to be highly profitable, wasn't right on the basis of what I saw in my course analysis of the New Zealand system and in what I had done with George Ramsbottom. And so, but as I, and, and look, people nodded and, and accepted and then did nothing about it. That was, that's where we sat in 2014. And then Alan Renwick's group out of um, Lincoln University did a really interesting re piece of research where they analyzed three years of dairy base. And they did a, this was a really interesting analysis, well beyond my econometric ability. But what, what they did was they looked at a low, medium and high input farms. And what were the changes that happened as we transitioned from low to medium and from medium to high across the years 2011, 12 and 13, which were good, good milk price years, weren't exceptional and weren't bad milk price years. They were just good milk price years. And so the black bar is transitioning from low to medium. The gray bar is transitioning from low to high input. And the white bar is the transition from medium input to high input so right across the board. So on the left hand side, you've got milk solids production. Hardly any surprise as you put in, as you, as you go from low to medium input in the New Zealand system. So you go from less than 500 kilos of, of supplemented cow to a ton of supplemented cow, you produce 6.3% more milk solids per hectare. And as you go, <clears throat> excuse me, you go from less than 500 kilos of cow to 1500 to 2000 uh, kilos of cow, you produce 14.2% uh, more milk solids per hectare. So that makes perfect sense. And, and then the, the, I, I won't go through the medium to high because I'll just be telling you guys how to suck eggs. Um, that, so that, that's fine, milk production went up. So did operating expenses. This is, and this isn't surprising, we're, we're buying feed. I mean, that's an expense. So your operating expenses per hectare is gonna go up. So our milk production went up 6.3%, our operating expenses went up 10.9%. Or in the case of the high input system, our uh, milk production went up 14.2 and our operating expenses went up 24.3. Now that, that in itself doesn't tell us anything about the profitability of that move because it depends obviously on what proportion of your revenue are expenses. But when you look at the operating profit, this is very similar to what I showed you earlier. There was virtually no difference in operating profit by go for, going from low to medium, from low to medium input or from low to high input. Um, I mean, I wouldn't worry about the minus 2.7 or a minus 1.2, you know, that, that will be lost in, in the noise. It's, it's a slight decline, but it, I, I, I'm saying there's no difference. But what they did point out, and this again changed the conversation in, in New Zealand was the effect on return on assets though was quite significant. By going from low to medium input with the change in fixed costs and assets that were associated with those change, there was a 20% reduction in uh, return on assets. Um, and by going from uh, low to high input, there was a 14.4% reduction. Um, by going from medium to high, because obviously you've incurred an awful lot of the capital expenses to begin with, actually there was an improvement in operating profit. So this was a really interesting analysis and I'm going to come back to this um, in, in, again. But I want to just step back into these hidden costs because, I mean, you know, what, what do Irish figures mean to, to farmers in the United Kingdom? At the same time, I was doing a, a, a work with AHDB. Um, some of you may have attended field days. I, I, um, I turned up at, um, through this period as well. And in analyzing the milk bench database at the time, we found that for every hundred pounds a UK farmer spent on feed, their total cost went up. 162 pounds. When we looked at it within New Zealand, and this was over 14 years, myself and Mark Neal at Dairy NZ analyzed 14 years of dairy base, and we found that on average, for every hundred dollars a New Zealand farmer spent on feed, somewhere between 150 and 180 dollars was the total increase in costs. So as I said earlier, nobody had anticipated this. When we do our partial budgets, for every hundred dollars you spend on feed, there's another maybe five or six dollars you spend on labor. There's an extra five or six dollars that you spend on machinery and oil and gas and repairs and maintenance, et cetera. So we always had, a, had the idea that, okay, for every hundred dollars somebody spends on feed, their total costs go up $120. We were vastly underestimating it. And on average, 
it went up $160. So it's very similar to the UK figure that we have there. But the question was, why? So that brings me to what is marginal milk? I'm sorry it's taken me this long to get to it, but hopefully it has set the scene for the discussion that we're going to, that, that we can have afterwards. So just so we're all on the same page, marginal milk is the additional milk produced when you make a change to your farming system. There can also be a reduction in milk produced when you make a change to your farming system. So for example, if you increase stocking rate and it increases your milk production, then the increase in milk production is your marginal milk from increasing stocking rate. If you feed concentrates in the shed, you increase the amount of concentrates that you're feeding, you increase your milk production. That increase in milk production is the marginal milk associated with the increase in concentrate use. If you increase your nitrogen fertilizer use and you grow more grass and you carry more cows and you increase your milk production by doing that, then that increase in milk production is the marginal milk associated with the increase with the increased use of nitrogen fertilizer. Or if you go from twice a day milking to three times a day milking or four times a day milking, depending on how much time you'd like to spend in the shed, the increase in milk production associated with that is the marginal milk associated with the increased milking frequency. Now there's obviously going to be additional feed going into that, etc. But just simplistically, that's the, the increase in milk product, that's the marginal milk associated with the change in the farm practice. Like I said, alternatively, you know, you could go once a day milking from twice twice a day milking. It generally ends up in a decrease in milk production, at least in the short term. Um, and often it does end up in a decrease in milk production. What you could say is that the that change in milk production, well, that was the marginal milk associated with milking twice a day. So Sorry, it's it's really, really hard, obviously, uh, sitting on, on the far end of a screen from you guys, but I'm hoping that that makes sense uh, because it's important that we're all on that same page, that the marginal milk is the additional milk that's produced when you make a change to your farm system. So it's the additional milk produced from that change. Now, the reason why I want to talk about this is because as I as I read more and more economic texts to try and understand this, um, you know, uh, this this became this became brutally honest to me in the United States. Um, we were milking fifteen hundred cows and seven hundred and fifty acres. Um, I couldn't pay the bills until I got rid of five hundred cows, and I couldn't understand why. I could I was getting supplements uh, as cheap as chips. I was sitting in the boot heel of Missouri, twenty miles from the Mississippi. So 20 miles from the biofuels distilleries, I could buy DDGs for next to nothing. I could get corn silage off my neighbor for next to nothing. I could get corn grain, corn hominy, you name it. Any list of ingredients, I would get them at a fraction of the price that anyone else could buy them. And yet I, I couldn't pay the bills until we took 500 cows out of that system, pull that much feed out. We didn't pull all the feed out. I'm not suggesting that for a second. Pull that much feed out. And that's what got me thinking about marginal milk. And the reason why I want to stress it here is this when, when we were taught, I was engaged on Twitter. Some of you may have been involved in this conversation. I don't know. I was engaged on Twitter about marginal milk. And I and and obviously, as you'll see in a second, a lot of the conversation is around intensification and uh, how, uh, what that does to the economics of the farm system. And uh one particular farmer took exception to this because he thought I was criticizing his farm system. And I should have said from the start, I'm not judging anybody for their farm system. I'm a you know, pointy headed academic sitting on a chair in an office um, while you guys are, are, are making your businesses work. Um, so that's not my intention. And please, uh, I hope nobody takes offense to anything I'm saying. Uh, but this person sent, put out this tweet and it stood out to me that if this if this was the attitude that profit, no matter how big or how small is still profit, was the argument against what I was saying, I bowed out of the conversation at that point. So as, although the statement is true, I, I wouldn't like to take it to my financial advisor or my bank manager when I was looking for an additional loan. So here's a theoretical example, and then I'm going to get into some practical examples. But I, the, uh, So if, if you think of a... A typical UK farm producing 1.8 million litres of milk and costing around 360,000 pounds to produce that milk. So 
that farm is producing milk for 20 pence a litre. If we think of a situation where they step it up a gear, they bring in some more inputs, uh, they increase their, their milk production by just over 10%, up to 2 million litres. It's costing 440,000 pounds now to produce that milk, but they're producing all of their milk for 22 pence a litre. So this is a highly profitable farm at a 30p milk price. You know, you, you wouldn't take a second look at this. And if you were comparing it back to my base farm, well, 20 pence, 22 pence, shit, he's producing a lot more milk. Um, you know, th there's nothing wrong with that. But if you calculate the, mar the cost of the marginal milk from those changes, the marginal milk is costing this farmer 40 pence. So although the farm is highly profitable, and this goes back to my point where I was sitting going, I can't understand how these farmers aren't making more money um, when the partial budgets um, work out the way they do. This farm is a highly profitable farm, very low cost, well, relatively low cost of production, and yet the change they made to is, is costing 40 pence a litre to produce that milk. Think of a different scenario. They go in a little bit harder with intensification, get more cows, put in more cubicles, whatever, um, and, and um, you know, are, but are producing a, a lot of milk, um, you know, producing nearly nearly 40% more milk than they, they were in the original base situation. Of course, the price of milk, the price of that milk has gone up, but they're producing so much more of it. They're still a highly profitable business considering the volume of milk and the margin that they're still making per liter. But the cost of that marginal milk is 52 pence a liter on average. So some of that marginal milk might have cost less and some of it might cost more. And I'm going to talk about that in a second with a real life situation that I came across in New Zealand. But I just want people to think about it. Although a farmer is producing milk for 22 pence, highly profitable, it's highly likely there's some milk in that system that he's paying, he or she is paying for the privilege of producing. Well, and if they were able to do that more effectively, because look, and, and I'll show you some of this later as well, some UK data later, but um, you know, a really, really good operator, runs a lean system, maybe already had all of the labor in the cubicle. So, you know, there wasn't a lot of additional expenses, just stepped in there, produced that milk, produced it more cheaply, even at 25 pence a liter, the cost of that, the average cost of that marginal milk is um, is 40 pence. So, um, so question though is, is, is um, marginal milk good or bad? Um, you know, what, 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 what is the, uh, the cost of production here? Uh, what is the cost and benefit? Uh, so you can, you can talk up the benefits. Obviously there's a greater revenue. For some people, there may be more free time. For others, there may be less free time. For some, it makes the business more flexible. They're milky, they're able to milk more cows, which means they're able to afford an additional labor unit, which allows them time off the farm. Um, for some, it doesn't do that. Uh, and and the costs, um, we need to talk about the costs from an environmental perspective as well, particularly in the current climate. And I'll touch on that. So just want to move on here quickly so that um, we... we... John, just, yeah, just before Jamie? you do move on, we've had a couple of questions coming in. Um, I suppose it's getting into the detail a little bit, but um, someone's asking about where you allocate homegrown silage, homegrown forage. Is that sort of as a pasture or should you be counting that as a bought in feed? Um, this, is the re this is the really difficult situation. I would be, so homegrown pasture for silage uh, for the milking platform makes the system run. And that to me is, is part of the homegrown feed rather than a purchase feed. But that's, that's very different to renting land to grow silage off the farm so that we can keep a higher number, a larger number of cows on the milking platform. Uh, bringing in silage from off the farm is a far more expensive proposition. I'll probably uh, some of this will probably make more sense, Jamie, after I've touched on these economics. Okay, we'll I hope. Let continue. Thank you very much. That's all right. It's all right. Hey, so, so look, uh, this, this was the, the paper from Alan Renwick's group that I showed you earlier, which showed that, um, you know, uh, low, medium, high input farms were in, in New Zealand were equally profitable from a, an operating profit perspective. There was a difference in return on assets. But why, you know, when 
when when you do the like I did, did very briefly earlier, the partial budget of you know feed feed in New Zealand costing us um, let's say on average thirty five cents a kilogram that produces let's say round numbers um, a hundred a uh, hundred grams of milk solids for ease of math and we're being paid seven dollars a kilo so we're getting seventy cents and we're only paying thirty five cents even with a little bit of additional costs at forty forty five we should be making a killing by bringing in these supplements. Why not? So if we look at, if, we, if I take the same um, uh, cartoon, but pull, put their data through this. So the average farmer was producing 930, sorry, the, average, the low input farmer was producing 930 kilograms of milk solids per hectare. It was costing him or her 4,000, just over $4,000 a hectare to produce it. So the average cost of production was $4.37 per kilo of milk solids. Sorry, I know I've switched to milk solids here, um, but I just, I didn't want to start using, um, I didn't want to start using assumptions around composition and, and, and then start changing the figures. Um, th th these are the figures out of the paper. Uh, the medium input was producing an, almost an extra 60 kilos of milk solids. Um, it was costing them four and a half thousand dollars a hectare, so five hundred dollars a hectare to produce an extra sixty kilos of milk solids. Um, and the average cost of production was four dollars fifty six. Now that's a very reasonable cost of production. You know, very similar to what I was talking about in a UK scenario of twenty p versus twenty two p. The vast majority of farmers wouldn't bat an eyelid at that difference. And yet what that says is that the cost of the marginal milk they produced was $7.56. If I look at the high input, they produced over a thousand kilos of milk solids on, on average per hectare. It was costing them, uh, this is on average, obviously, you know, so think of Northland to Southland and, and all, all the variability in that. Uh, that this was costing them an extra five hundred dollars above the medium, so an extra thousand dollars a hectare to produce um, that extra hundred and thirty kilos of milk solids. Their average cost of production was again four dollars seventy six. So you know, if you're being paid seven dollars a kilo of milk solids, this is a highly profitable business. But the cost of the marginal milk through that intensification was seven dollars fifty. So when you break that, and that's, sorry, that's the, co the average cost of the marginal milk. I'm going to show you a farmer example in a second that, uh, that, is, that is really important. Um, so now, so when, you, when you start breaking it down in this way, or when I started breaking it down this way, because I'm pretty slow and it takes me a while to get these things, I could now understand why farmers were producing a lot more milk, but weren't making any more money from an economic point of view. I still couldn't understand it from a biophysics point of view, but I, I'm coming back to that in a second as well. If you look at George Ramsbottom's data, slight decline in, in profitability with increasing use of non-pasture feeds. Um, the, the base price of their milk was 18 cents um, per uh, kilo, sorry, 18 cents per liter of milk. Um, when they intensified, the cost, the average cost of the marginal milk was 37 to 39 cents per liter of milk. And it was only in exceptionally high milk price years that they were going to be able to cover the cost of that marginal milk. So again, remember, there's this isn't saying no supplements in the system. There's still 10% of the cow's diet that's coming in as a concentrate byproduct uh, straight type feed and the grass silage that they make on the home platform is included in this. However, the purchase feed includes feed, grass silage that's being brought in from farms outside. So that, hopefully that clears up that question. But this is the farmer. This was, this was one of the places where the penny really dropped for me. Um, we used to run something in Dairy NZ called a whole farm assessment where uh, a number of individuals, farmers would request a whole farm assessment and, um, you know, a farm systems expert and a nutritionist and a, and a labor expert and a, maybe a grass expert would all come out, sit down with the farmer and, and, and his or her family, understand what their goals were, what they really wanted to achieve, etc. And then look at the farm system and see what could be done to help them better achieve those goals. And what, this was one particular example of a farmer that did that. He came back to the home farm 
and um, realised very quickly his dad, his dad was ill. Um, so I came back to the home farm. There was a, a contract milker on the farm and he realised very quickly they were losing money hand over fist. So he asked Darian said to do a whole farm assessment. And ha having done that, he asked them if I personally would come out and have a look over the system from a nutrition point of view and give him some thoughts on the economics. And to do that, he sent me the last uh, five, six financial years um, data that he had. And his farm had transitioned through time. It had gone from being predominantly grass silage to being almost 50% of the cow's diet coming from outside the farm, uh, uh, big Holstein cows being fed a lot of supplement. And, and But what I really took for it when I looked at his economics um, uh, is this is the base price for milk in this region. And I know this to be true. So farmers not feeding supplements in this region are producing milk for about, or at this point, we're producing milk for about $3 a kilo of milk solids. When this farmer's costs were $4, so still highly profitable at a good milk price, the cost of his marginal milk was $5.60. Now, if you're getting paid more than $6 a kilo of milk solids, that's still a very profitable business strategy to be in. However, when his co average cost went to $5, the cost of the marginal milk between $4 and $5 was $10.75. When he changed his system following the farms, the whole farm analysis, the cost of the marginal milk he took out of his system was $17 a kilo of milk solids. And that year he was being paid $3.90. So that just shows you that not all marginal milk is unprofitable. And I, I do want to be clear on that. I'm going to talk some more about that. So the hidden costs, I was going to come back to this. Oh, and, I'm going to, and then, yeah, sorry, Jamie. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you again, but we've had a really good question come in and it just links perfectly to what you were talking about. So um, obviously in the UK, we've got quite a lot more um, of the high input systems. And one person who's with us tonight has said that they milk 9,000 litre Holsteins. They're feeding in excess of two tonnes of concentrate um, and commenting that that's probably lots of marginal milk um, and that they could eliminate that um, by cutting feed but obviously in that type of system cow health is likely to be compromised so would would the only route to eliminating his marginal milk production be changing his entire system or is there something within his system that could work? Uh, I, I'm going to ask you to hold that for five minutes, Jamie, because, oh. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, it is a really great question. And I, I, I'm not, I, I don't want to put it too far on the long finger, but I've got, I've got a research project that I just want to show the results of, which, which will explain, uh, which, which will go some way to us being able to discuss that, that, that question. Fab, that's, we're on topic. Right. Thank you. That's all right. That's a great question though. Thank you. Um, so look, so I, I, I showed this earlier, you know, right across um, Ireland, the UK and New Zealand, you know, we found that, you know, when any farmer spends $100 or £100 or €100 Euro on feed, their total costs go up somewhere around £160 or dollars or euros. It's a, you know, it, 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 the consistency of it is actually quite staggering um, when, I, when I look at it. Now, there's a range around that, obviously, and it will vary from farm to farm. But why is that? Well, the, the place where we have most of the information in this was in George Ram's bottoms analysis. And this, the blue line here is the change in variable expenses, what are termed variable expenses on a farm as feed expenses go up. And the, the, the figure means that for every one euro, in this case, for every one euro spent on feed by an Irish farmer, his or her variable costs go up one euro 18. Now that makes sense. This is what we talked about. You know, there's there's labor costs, there's repairs and maintenance, there's machinery costs, there's those types of costs that come along with a slightly more intensive system. And so most people wouldn't disagree with that 18 cents at all. But what was really striking was the so-called fixed costs increased as well. In fact, they increased by twice the amount that the very the non-feed variable costs increased. And this started me talking about that their fixed costs are a misnomer. They're not fixed. They're actually mixed costs because there's a mixture of fixed and variable costs in them. There's, so you take electricity, you pay line charges. It doesn't matter how much electricity you use, 
you pay line charges. That's a fixed cost. But the rest of your electricity bill is variable. It depends. If you milk more cows, sheds on for longer, you're cooling more milk, you will use more, more electricity and, and vice versa, obviously. So they're mixed costs. And, and, and I hadn't come across anyone that had really thought about this at an ag economic level before, that, sudden, that, that actually our so-called fixed costs were increasing as we produced more milk, as we fed more feed. Because the standard argument that you will all have heard is that you produce more milk, you dilute your fixed costs. That doesn't seem to bear through. Now, uh, so this is this is this is the piece of research that I want to quickly show you before I touch on the environment, and then we and, and enter into into discussions. Sorry, this has taken me longer than I thought it would, but um, this was a this is where the penny eventually dropped for me from a biophysical perspective. So, right, I get it. It's costing us more uh, than we thought. Um, how, but why is that the case? So this was a farm systems experiment that was run in New Zealand. We published a couple of years ago in the Journal of Dairy Science. And, and the reason why I put it up here is it, it, it speaks to a lot of that, just the point of that question. Um, what it allows us to do, so you've got, you've got two very different comparisons here. You've got a very highly stocked system, and I know 4.4 cows per hectare will seem like an incredibly highly stocked system, but uh, it's not. 3.3 cows per hectare is where we would we would normally stock on a grass-only system. So it's carrying an extra cow in a bit per hectare and bringing the feed in to feed them. So on the left-hand side, that circle, 4.4 cows per hectare, no purchase feed, just running a, a really highly stocked system. And you'll see that. Look at the milk solids per cow. 267 kilos of milk solids per cow. It's a really low per cow yielding system, moderate per hectare yielding system. And then on the right of that, we have, we have systems where we're bringing in 1.3 ton of maize grain per cow or 1.1 ton of maize silage per cow as a supplement to feed those additional cows. So that gives us, uh, so that allows us to produce 1,745 1, kilos of milk solids per hectare on the maize grain treatment and 1,000, approximately 1,600 kilos of milk solids on the maize silage treatment per hectare, they're both per hectare. So that allows us to look at a, 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 a system and putting in or taking out feed. Okay, so this comes back to the, the question that's just been asked. Um, but it also allows us to look at uh, a lower stock system where the feed isn't actually needed. So if you look at that, the third line down, it says CSR. That's what we call a comparative stocking rate. And, and, and that's trying to account for all of the feed in the system. So the optimum comparative stocking rate from our economic analysis is somewhere between 85 and 90. So the, 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 the treatment on the left is um, is looking at uh, is, is is optimally stocked. If you look on the far right, with our where we're bringing in the feed, those systems are also optimally stocked stocked from a feed perspective, um, which I think is the system that, that that question was describing. Okay, enough of the of the description. Forget about the operating profit. I'm not worried about that. That's totally dependent on milk price. Um, just ignore that line. I should have actually taken it out because it's not what I really wanted to talk about. This, the reason why I put this up is it allows two completely different comparisons. It allows us to look at this situation where we're milking so many cows, do we bring in feed or not? And it allows us to evaluate the, okay, sorry, let, let me just deal with that for a second. So if you look at the marginal cost of the milk in that, sorry, the cost of the marginal milk in that situation, it's $6.33. Uh, for the maize grain, because maize grain costs us more than maize silage, and it's five dollars fifty-four for the maize for the maize silage. Now, in our systems in New Zealand, um, when when we dis did these analyses, we were being paid about five dollars fifty. But you know, over the last decade, it's been somewhere in the six dollars to seven dollar range, up and down around that. So this marginal milk is actually profitable. Okay, uh, so highly stocked system, bring in feed to feed the cows. Um, th this marginal milk is, is, is highly profitable. And that's where we were doing the partial budgets. So 
that's why the partial budgets were working out reasonably well. But this trial also allowed us to analyze, hang on a minute, what if we didn't intensify or what if we made the decision to actually milk less cows? We take out the need for some or all in this case, but some of that supplement. What is the cost of the marginal milk by milking more cows and actually bringing in the feed to milk them? And that was where the penny dropped. The cost, despite the fact our biological response to the supplement was exactly the same, we were getting 1 to 1.1 litres of milk for every kilogram of grain we were bringing into the system. It didn't matter whether we were bringing them into a high stock system or bringing them into a low stock system to increase stocking rate. The cost of the marginal milk by milking more cows and um, producing uh, and, and feeding the cows to do that was far was 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 a very um, was very expensive. Look, I'm I'm, I'm going to move through. Just just skip these slides because um, that they're an interesting story, but they're they're telling the same story again. Uh, so look, from a financial point of view, when I've analysed the uh, just to show you that I'm not hopefully show you that I'm not cherry picking studies here to make a point. If you look at George Ram's bottom uh, on farm data in Ireland. Um, Marginal milk was costing, on average, four euro seventy-five per kilo of milk solids, or thirty-eight cents per liter, or approximately thirty-two p, thirty-three p um, UKP. When I look at the New Zealand data, analysing again across the farm database, um, it was around four dollars fifty per kilo. Sorry, four euros fifty per kilo of milk solids, or around thirty-six cents. When I look at the research trials. Kevin McDonald's experiment that I showed you there earlier, it was around four euro seventy-five per kilo of milk solids for the marginal milk uh, to, to intensify and produce the marginal milk. It was around thirty-eight cents per liter. And then, like the, the one I skipped over, was was showing exactly the same thing. So on average, marginal milk from increasing stocking rate and importing feed was around. 35 to 45 European cents, or around 28 to 35 British pence. Um, so it wasn't very profitable. I'm going to come back to, to to answer that question in a second, Jamie. But I just want to I just want to touch on on two other costs that I think are important. One is the environment. So there's two environmental concerns when we, we're in grazing: nitrate leaching and the carbon footprint. Look, these are New Zealand data. They're they're the they're the best, most controlled data that 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 we have um, that I've seen on farm systems experiments measuring nitrate loss. Um, from left to right here, you see a low input system, actually no nitrogen fertilizer, stocked reasonably well, and then you work through to uh, nitrogen fertilizer, uh, a small amount of feed, and all the way through to a high amount of feed. So half of the half of the feed of the cows going in as a non-pasture feed. That's on the top left. On the top, on the bottom right, you see what happens to nitrate leaching. Now, that doesn't have to happen. I stress that. Um, when when you've got standoff facilities, sheds, etc., like you do in the UK, this is a standoff facility. You can see that actually by utilizing that in the autumn, um, we can reduce the amount of nitrogen that's lost. So this is not a fait accompli. But if we're just looking at the effect of intensification, there is a big increase in um, in nitrogen loss from the system. Um, from a from a greenhouse gas perspective, again, just putting up this experiment of Kevin McDonald's, um, you saw saw the difference in 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 the marginal cost. So just feeding cows within your system, as as Dylan talked about doing in terms of extending that autumn, etc. Then the marginal cost of that is actually quite reasonable relative to the milk price. That's our dollars per kilo of milk solids. Um, uh, however, the the question should always be asked is: Should I be milking that number of cows, or if I was milking less cows and carrying uh, using more, less supplements, would I be making more money? The other thing that's coming to the fore and will in the, in the future is carbon and the cost of carbon. And uh, so the low input system in this in in this example was producing approximately 1.5 ton of carbon dioxide, sorry, 1,500 ton of carbon dioxide equivalents uh, from that system. By intensifying, 
we were producing between 30 and 50 percent more carbon from that farm and that's simply methane that's being produced by the feed that's um as well as a small allowance for increased ni uh, nitrous oxide losses as well but it's predominantly methane and that's just simply um the more more feed we put down a cow's throat the more methane that comes out so one final cost i want to leave you with um and i think this is an important one and it's one we don't talk about enough and it's one that i learned uh unfortunately the hard way my time in america i spent uh three years in america when my my eldest here on uh, he's older now but on the right hand side of that figure when ryan was one two and uh three years of age in in those three years i spent 200 nights a year away from home um and i did i did that because i because of the system i had established and i i needed to um to save it i i eventually didn't but that's a longer discussion it'll be another day but it was um I think it's really, really important that we understand why we're doing this. And uh, these were these were data I pulled out of the UK Milk Bench database uh, going back seven or eight years now. Um, I can't remember actually. So yes, it's seven or, or eight years. And uh, what what the graph is 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 the number of cows a farmer would have to milk to earn the average national wage in the UK. So it was a 28 pence milk price at the time. The average national wage, which is not the average industrial wage, it's the average wage of a teacher or a nurse, I think was 28,000 pounds. I might be wrong in that. I'm, I'm going back in my memory, but it was it was in that range. Um, the top 25% of grazing, spring calving grazing farmers had to milk 50 cows to earn the average national wage. And the top 25% of the high input, high output farms had to milk 50 cows to earn the average national wage. Ironically, it was exactly the same in Ireland. Myself and Brendan Horn calculated this for Ireland and it took 50 cows to earn the average national wage for the top 20% of their farmers. What was really eye-opening is when I dropped to the average farmer, the average spring calving grazing farmer in the UK needed to milk 139 cows to earn the average national wage. It was exactly the same in Ireland, 135 cows. We calculated the average farmer in Ireland would have to milk to earn the average national wage. But in the high input, high output, all year round calving system, the average farmer had to milk 400 cows. And so, you know, you ask any audience who here is a, 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 an above average driver, and 95% of uh, hands will go up. You know, who here is an above average farmer? 95% of hands will go up. That's not reasonable. You know, uh, what, what we know in any audience is we've got a bell curve and 50% are below the average of that audience. Generally speaking, the audience will be above average. There's no doubt about that because they're, they're self-improving by turning up to these things. But um, I think that's something that we need to bear in mind as well. So I want to come back to, to answer that question after this summary is uh, on average, marginal milk from supplements is um, more expensive than the cost of the base milk. There's no question about that. However, some marginal milk is profitable and it offers flexibility. And, and as Dylan was describing earlier, you know, not feeding a lot of supplement in, in that middle part of the year when um, when he can do it off grass and uh, he's not being paid as much for his milk or he and Hannah are not being paid as much for their milk and taking that supplement and, and putting it into the autumn when they're being paid more for their milk and they can't do it off grass. So it, it extends the shoulders of the year. That's, it, 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 without, without having analyzed Dylan and Hannah's uh, system, obviously, but that sounds like a very sensible strategy and a very profitable use of supplements for marginal milk. However, intensification, and this is where we get caught up in some is good, therefore more must be better. So I've put some supplement into the shoulders to actually balance my system, allow me to produce milk in the front and the back end of the year. Well, that's, that's worked really well. So now why don't I put in more supplements and drive up my stocking rate um, and, and produce even more milk? That almost always, is very expensive milk. The research data, whether it's on-farm uh, databases or, or uh, experimental databases, suggest that the cost of that milk is somewhere between 28 and 35 pence. It definitely increases the carbon footprint. You know, if you're producing more milk, you can only do that by bringing in more feed. If you're bringing in more feed, 
then uh, or you're are utilizing more feed you don't have to be bringing it in if you're utilizing more feed then that produces more methane so look it's uh, in in our data we increased our milk production by 60 percent but we produced 30 percent more methane by doing that uh, it will likely increase the nitrogen footprint um, or the capital expenditure to manage that nitrogen footprint and we can talk about that um, but I do want to stress that 10% of the cow's diet from supplement offers flexibility. I'm not suggesting for a second that you take out all the supplement and you throw the cows out of the sheds and um, et cetera. Hopefully what I've, I've provided is some context around uh, the journey I've gone on to realize, you know, the partial budgets are completely misleading. The margin overfeed or the margin overfeed and fertilizer, they're completely misleading. You need to do a full system analysis. So Jamie, that's me done. Um, I, I'm happy to stop sharing my screen now and put my, my camera back on if that's the most appropriate thing to do. Yes, please, that sounds good. We've been able okay. to see you all the way through. Your camera is on. Oh, good, good. Oh, <laughs> lucky, I wasn't, lucky I wasn't doing anything rude then, wasn't I? <laughs> <laughs> I was very impressed when you checked your phone because we did speak to John beforehand and said if there was any sound problems, I would send him a message and he's dutifully checked every time just in case it was me. So thank you, John. Um, right. There is a question that's come in um, just literally based on your last point. So you were talking about 10 percent of the cow's diets being supplementary feed, being the most flexible. Someone is asking, is that optimum? And does that also include dry cow feed? Yeah, look, that's that that, that is a great question. Um, and there is no easy answer. Um, so look, my brother, my brother at home farms uh, on an average year, whatever friggin average year is now. You know, he's got 2,100 mil of rain, heavy free, heavy draining soils, heavy poorly draining soils. You know, evapotranspiration of 300 mil. So he's trying to drain 1,800 mil through what would have been a bog uh, back um, before uh, we, we, it was all reclaimed um, several hundred years ago. Um, he does that with about 350. Uh, Moore Park uh, used to talk about 350. Um, I believe that that was probably too tight for, for a lot of farmers, certainly in the part of the country that I come from, where we need a, a degree more flexibility in the spring, because we can't turn out when Moore Park does, and we might have to come in earlier. And so we needed that flexibility in the autumn. So I, I've kind of gone with that 500 to 600, because that's approximately 10% of the cow's diet. Let me come back to that in a second. The the most recent analysis I saw at a Moor Park was sitting at around 700 kilos per cow being that optimum. So if you if you think about it um, as somewhere in that range, the most the most profitable dairy farmer I know in the world does not feed any supplement whatsoever, and has has his his compounded annual growth rate has constantly sat in the 20s since he was a share milker. Many of you will know him, but I'm not going to mention his name. It's um, and so it's 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 not a hard 500, I suppose. Jamie is what I'm talking about. But your the second point of your question there does it include dry feed, uh, dry cow feed? Um, no, I think I think we it, it, so in the South Island, for example, um, we winter cows off farm on crop. That's our dry cow feed. We generally talk about maybe around 700 kilos, 7 to 800 kilos in total a cow in that system where the 250 to 300 kilos that are sitting in the dry cow feed and then there's there's 400, 500 kilos sitting in the milking cow. The reason why I've, I sit on that 500 to 600 it is just simply, simply my simplicity of thought. It's nothing, it's not, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's not a scientific rule. Um, Ten, uh, five, 500 kilos is five kilograms a cow for 100 days. Or it's, you know, it's 2.5 kilos a cow for 200 days. I struggle to see in a predominantly grazing system where we would put five kilos a cow in for 100 days. It's, it's a, you know, it's a, I'm including the silage that's been grown on the milking platform as being a part of the milking platform's feed. So, it's on top of that, um, so that that's where I think that's where I think there is a sweet spot somewhere between where my brother is, 350, 400 kilos, through to that 700, 800, and it isn't a hard line and anywhere in there. 
Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you very much. Yep. Yeah, and I'm, I'm keen to bring Dallin into the conversation now as well, really. Um, we've got time okay. for a couple more questions, so encourage people to to send them in if they would like to. I, I haven't answered. I haven't answered that question that was asked either. But let's let's bring Dylan in. And but please give give me one or two minutes to answer that 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 key question that was asked, so I don't avoid it. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Um. So Dylan, we've talked a bit about feed and the work life balance and labour units and things like that. And I guess I wanted to ask you about how you've reached the system that you're at. I suppose. And you know, have you? had years where you feel like you've put a bit too much in or scrimped maybe a little bit and perhaps efficiency has suffered? Um, to be perfectly honest, I think, so we started our joint venture in 2015. So that's when the kind of the milk price crash and it was, it was survival mode really. Um, and I suppose we were fortunate we were low stocked so we could um, depend on kind of grazed grass or home homegrown forages really. Um, I suppose what makes it difficult for us when you've got um, higher cash needs for you know everybody involved within the bigger business that has to be serviced um, and you have to try and consider that into the bigger picture I suppose. if when the cash needs isn't there, you can take a completely different approach to the business. So somebody else has actually asked that. So I might come back to you, John. So when you need to earn a certain amount of money to cover your rent, your mortgage, your repayments, those things, um, but you know you would make more profit with less marginal milk, what are the options there? That's a, it's a really it's a really interesting question. Um, and look, I, I, I agree completely with what Dylan has just said as well. And um, you know, uh, I, I, there's I have a couple of analogies with that if we had more time. But uh, so you, you've got a, you've got yes, you, you you generate revenue and then you pay your your expenses. So you have they are genuinely fixed expenses. Your rent will be a fixed expense. There's no question about that. Um, but if your profitability is undermined is is reduced by producing additional milk that additional milk isn't contributing any margin to helping you pay that rent or any of those expenses if it's costing you more to produce that milk you have less money to pay those fixed costs and the reason why i think the reason why i think it's a great question because it's it's you know we have rural lenders here we have people working in the bank that are giving farmers that advice that you need to produce this much milk to be able to service this debt. Despite the fact, if they produce that extra 10 or 20% of, of milk, they have less money to pay the, the interest in the bank. Um, so it's, it, 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 it's a really great question. I'm really glad you asked it, but that's, so that's my answer to it, is that if, if the marginal milk is costing you more than you're being paid to produce it, then it's undermining your ability to, to meet your fixed cost. If the marginal milk, is cheaper than what your than, than your milk price, should, then 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 that's you're still in that sweet spot of, of economic optimum. Okay. Um, somebody else has asked. I suppose it's a similar question. Maybe it's the same question again. But when they've already got the infrastructure associated with these higher stocking rates, it goes against the grain a little bit to leave empty cubicles, those kind of things. But is, is that what you would advise people to do? Uh, look, no, I, uh, well, no, not, not as a blanket recommendation, but certainly to look at it. <clears throat> certainly to look at it. Um, look, there's some, so there's some costs. So, so here, here again is the is, and it's an argument I hear all the time. And for some people, it is a very valid argument, and for others, it's it's just actually it's kind of the ostrich situation of I'm I'm sticking my head in the sand and I'm not going to look at my business at all. Um, if you've built cubicles, you've already built them you're paying for them. you've you 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 are either paying for them or you have paid for them and and that's going to continue um if continuing to use them is producing milk that's costing you more than you're being paid for them it makes no sense to continue to use those assets and the example the example i have in the us um 
where I said, look, I, I wasn't able to pay the bills until I took a third of the cows out of the system. And of course, I heard tested and I took the bottom third of the cows out of the system. So I wasn't stupid about it. <clears throat> but um, I had to go in and take the key out of the tractor because I couldn't stop my farm manager feeding brewers. Wasting grass and feeding brewers. No, so you're the worst of both worlds there. Um, but the, the the brewers was cheap. The tractor was there, etc. We we could do it. The cows were there to 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 be fed. Um, so sorry, it's a long answer. Again, it comes back to the if using that is producing milk that's costing you less than your milk price, continue to use them. If if using them is producing milk that's costing you more than your milk price, then you're paying for the privilege twice. You paid for the privilege of having them and you're paying for the privilege of producing milk as well. And Dallin, I think you've just recently invested in a little bit of kit to help reduce the cost of actually feeding your cows in the winter. Um, I think you'd worked out you were using quite a bit of diesel going back and forth carrying silage if I remember correctly. Yeah, well, it was the cost of diesel, um, time and wastage. So when you're going back and forth 30 times with a grab of silage in the winter and you're losing 5% or whatever, just falling out the bottom of the tines. Um, so, yeah, um, we didn't spend much money. We bought a second-hand machine, pretty cheap. Um, I wouldn't be able to justify buying a brand new machine just to feed dry cows or to try and get some more milk in the autumn. But um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, investing would be probably maybe the wrong word to use because I don't think it's an investment, but it's um, simplified operations, let me say. Yeah, fair enough. Um... There's a couple of people asking more specifically about carbon footprint. And I know, Dylan, this was something that you were talking about previously. Um, John, I'm not sure if there's differences in the way in which you measure carbon footprint in New Zealand versus the UK. Um, but certainly a couple of the people listening in have commented on the fact that in the UK, there's a number of high input high yielding type herds who are claiming a very low carbon footprint. Um, what you talked about during the presentation was the exact flip of that. Um, so is there a problem in how carbon footprint is being calculated? Um, is, is, is it, are we getting it wrong or what should we be thinking about? And then, and then if we don't know where we are, how can we possibly improve our carbon footprint? Like that's well, that that's that's a really great question, Jamie. So there are different ways of of calculating carbon footprint. Just to confuse things, um, there's the the scientific way, which is a whole life cycle analysis, which would mean that if you, um, you know, if you were importing soybeans from Brazil, then the the rainforest that was cut down uh, to to plant that soybean and then the transport costs and everything like that would be all included. And then you get a full system analysis. That's not that's not how any of us do it at a national inventory level. So there are standard international rules at a at a at an inventory level. Um, the diff so sorry, and that's I'm really glad people ask that so I don't send people away confused. The 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 the, the increase in the carbon footprint that I was talking about was at a hectare level, at a hectare or at a cow level, but at a hectare level in in the example that I gave you. The example that I think you're mentioning, Jamie, will be at a litre level. So if you produce a lot more milk and you dilute the maintenance cost of the animal, then your carbon footprint per litre of milk will will be reduced. It's not as great as people think. It, it, it is actually not as great as people think, because although the cow is more efficient, the system requires an awful lot more fuel and oil and, and, and petrochemicals. Um, to actually drive that system, uh, but but there is an improvement. Um, now that's great from a marketing point of view. Depending on who you're supplying, they can then market that as a carbon footprint per liter of milk, and a consumer might like to buy that. At a government level, and I don't know where the UK government is at this. I know there's, it's a bit fluid between UK and Europe at the moment. Um, but at a government level, they will require every business to reduce their carbon footprint. 
And if you think about our business, it's driven by hectares. The vast majority of us are milking cows on land. And so by intensifying, you will certainly drive up the carbon footprint of your business, but you might drive down the carbon footprint of every liter of milk. Uh, so it, it, it's uh, for your business, I think the most important thing is going to be the total carbon footprint of your business, not the total carbon footprint divided by the liters of milk that you produce. But I don't know, maybe the UK government is going to approach it differently. Okay, so we're, we're moving into the final few minutes of the webinar and John, I'm well aware we need to come back to the question that we've been saving up. But before we do then, Dalan, just on the carbon footprint, is that something that your milk buyer has been asking for? Is it something that you think about very much in your business? Um, you know, are you changing anything at the moment to try to improve or where are you at? Um, so at the minute, no, it's not something that our milk buyer um, is requesting for us to do. Um, I'm on the fence, to be honest. Um, I'm reluctant to do too much at the minute because I don't know what the right thing to do is because there's no guidelines by the government. Um, I think we're doing quite a good job. You know, we're not. We're not. I think we're doing what we can at the minute with the lack of knowledge of what the government expects of us until we know what we're supposed to be doing where we can't really do anything proactively that's absolutely fair enough um and i probably should say with my ahdb hat on that at the moment ahdb have got a project going on and um, doing some carbon footprinting on farms in the hope of gathering a data set that's that's large enough that will allow farms to compare against each other um, and, and try and learn from each other around reducing that. But, you know, that's at the farm level rather than the, the government level. So in, 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 New in New Zealand, Jamie, every farmer and grower in New Zealand will have to know their carbon footprint by the end of next year. That's that's the, the policy stipulation. Wow. Well. It is also the hot topic of conversation here, um, but I think that there are a lot of different tools that people are using to calculate their carbon footprint. Um, so, yeah. Can I, can, can I, can I, uh, this is a completely different subject, but if I could have one minute just to give you a piece of good news. So a science paper we published uh, three or four months ago, I'm happy to send it on, you can distribute it if you want. Um, looked at the total warming impact of a person's over a person's life of changing their diet. So I, I listen to the debate all the time about if we all go vegan, we'll save the planet. Blah blah blah. Um, it would be a very, it would be a real disruption to my life if I were to do that. Um, uh, taking methane into account and the short-lived nature of methane coming from ruminant agriculture into account. If someone were to go vegetarian, so take all red meat out of their diet uh, around the age of 21, 22, you know, when they move out of home and they actually start paying for themselves and they can make their own decisions, you will, on, on, the, on a calorie basis, you re reduce your total warming impact in the climate by about three to four percentage units. On a protein basis, which is what we consume meat and dairy for, you reduce your total warming impact by two percentage units and you do not have a balanced micronutrient intake. So that's that's published in the journal Sustainability. So if anyone wants to have that discussion with any of their, their friends on Facebook, there's plenty of information to, to counter the narrative. What I wanna do is, is get us to a point where we're stop having this, you know, this pseudo, pseudo animal rights discussion in the climate space, and we actually all start doing the right thing uh, for the future. That was a big topic in 30 seconds, John. So we'll come back to the, the, the marginal liters and the question that we've been saving up. Yeah, okay, so look, and that was a great question. And the short answer is, I don't really have an answer for that. Um, I, because uh, we, we farm for more than profit. I, all of you guys farm for more than profit. And, um, and so you've got to enjoy doing what you're doing. And so uh, for someone to, take their system and throw it completely out and swing to the to, to a completely different system. That's, well, that, certainly I, I, I personally, I don't think I could do that. I don't think I'd have the cojones to do that. Although 
you know, there's a number of examples down Dylan's part of the world where 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 that was done, and take my hat off to them. You know, just recognizing a system that wasn't working and 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 going 180 degrees the opposite direction. Um, to keep 9,000 liter cows or anything greater than that is really really difficult in a grazing system. There's got to be a huge amount of supplements going into that system to do that. Um, I'm also acutely aware of supply contracts and the need to flatten lactation curves, etc. And I've been focused very heavily on a spring calving situation. Um, so my advice there is, um, well, certainly I, not all of that margin of milk will be unprofitable. My suggestion is to look at the system. Just having listened, digest, I'm happy to have a separate conversation offline um, and just look at the system. Is there milk being produced here that's just not making me money? Am I using soybean when I could be using DDGs and it's gaining me you know, this much milk, but it's costing me this much more to do? Um, and then particularly when you go to grass, that's when a lot of marginal milk that's being produced from non-grass sources can be can be unprofitable again i'm talking in generalities because i don't know the individual situation so definitely not saying that you know the three thousand liters of milk above the average grazing cow is um is is unprofitable that's not what i meant to say here tonight no john and i don't think you did so thank you very much um and i think that that does kind of um sort of bring things together really quite nicely because um we have um, a, a KPI tool, so a key performance indicator tool, which AHDB developed as a result of realizing that there was the, the industry were using in excess of 90 key performance indicators. Um, and similarly to everyone claiming to be a, an above average driver, um, surely all 90 can't be the key ones. Um, so AHDB have worked with the wider dairy industry in the UK and sort of um, siphoned it down to to just a few associated with each system. And a lot of what you've talked about tonight, John, about the financials, uh, they are incorporated into that. So if anyone wants to look at their own numbers, um, calculate their own cost of production, look at their operating costs, look at their farm key performance indicators, then I would absolutely recommend that you go onto the AHDB website and look for the KPI Express tool um, by simply plugging in a few of your own farm uh, statistics and numbers. You can get yourself a benchmark of, of where you are in terms of top 25% average or more in that bottom third. Um, and it can really be a business driver, I suppose, to help people push on, seek to be in the top 25% and I suppose improve your businesses year on year. So absolutely go on the HDB website and have a look at the KPI Express tool. Um, you can, once you've got your own figures in there, you can benchmark with other British farmers, um, actually all of our strategic farms have put their figures into the tool. So you could go on to the website and have a look at um, Dalan's figures, although I would just caution, I think they're due to be updated. So if you're comparing, make sure that you're comparing the right year um, because that can be uh, quite critical. Um, so yeah, Dalan, John, any final thoughts just as we, as we bring this evening to a close? Dalan. Um, I suppose the big, the big um, question in my mind really is, um, yeah, if it'd be good to have some sort of clarity from, the, well, I suppose the government or the HDB to work with the government to bring a, a good, credible sort of template, and um, we can actually get our farm audited and we can try and improve or continue what we're doing. Well, that's really fab to hear. And I know that there's a lot of work going on within AHDB um, trying to help work towards that. But it is a work in progress, I think. So we'll keep you updated on that. John. Uh, look, Jamie, just to endorse actually what you said for a finish. Um, benchmarking, it's, it's, it's key. Um, I know there's research out there and I, I, for, I think it's UK research that shows that, that, that farmers that benchmark outperform farmers that don't. Um, now, that's probably, um, you know, a chicken and egg situation there as well, but you can't manage what you don't measure. So 
let's let's find out where you are and and where the weaknesses in your system are. Brilliant! What a fab take home message. Thank you so much. So. Thanks to both of you um, for giving up your evening or your morning, whichever hemisphere you're in. Um, I think when you add a farm case study, it, it makes it seem much more real. So Dalan, thank you for being part of the conversation. It really does make a difference. Um, and hopefully over the next year, we'll have lots more sort of on-farm events as well, so that people can match the, the digital discussion with the face-to-face -face discussion on-farm. Um, and just to remind everyone, this webinar is being recorded, so you'll be able to watch it again on YouTube. Um, and for those who are listening live, we would be really, really grateful if you would fill out the evaluation form, which is going to be emailed across to you. Um, we do read all of them and we do really value your feedback. It helps keep us on track. It helps make sure that we're delivering what you need. Um, and, and value for your levy. Um, and with that in mind, I'd also highlight that next spring, so spring 2022, there will be an opportunity for levy payers to um, have a vote on the services that AHDB provide. So if you're a levy payer, please do look out over the next couple of months um, for the register to vote. Um, you'll need to register in order to have your say, but we really, really do want to hear from as many people as possible to make sure that we're delivering value for money. So thank you so much again to both of our speakers and we wish everybody a good night and uh, yeah, happy farming for the next financial year. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.